Well, this morning, I want to bring the first of a few messages that are going to focus on gratitude and thanksgiving. And so the title of the message this morning is A Grateful Nation. And the reason I, I titled it that is um, perhaps you've witnessed that moving presentation at the funeral of one of our veterans who's passed away where a uh, nicely, sharply dressed officer representing one of our branches of the military will take a carefully folded flag and he will uh, kneel down there at the uh, uh, beside the uh, family and he'll say on behalf of the President of the United States and a grateful nation please accept this flag as a symbol of our appreciation for your loved ones honorable and faithful service and uh, if you've ever seen that you know I, I've not had the experience of um, being a officiant at the funeral for a veteran who died in war. Uh, but I have participated in the funerals of veterans who just served. They served for a while and either they had a career and, and these were all natural causes kinds of situations. Uh, but it's very moving uh, to, to see them fold that flag and uh, it's appropriate, isn't it? These people uh, gave a portion of their lives, uh, in some cases all, uh, their life uh, for the service of their country. And uh, it's appropriate uh, that they're honored in such a way. Uh, I only recently uh, discovered that in addition uh, to the flag, a certificate appropriate for framing uh, along with the flag comes from the president and it reads as follows this certificate is awarded by a grateful nation in recognition of devoted and selfless consecration to the service of our country and the armed forces of the United States and so in spite of all of our disagreements and quarrels uh, we do have much uh, to be grateful for. And uh, we are a grateful nation uh, when our men and women serve uh, and, and even when they are, are killed in their service. We are a grateful nation for that. But we also are grateful for God's extraordinary hand of blessing on our nation. Uh, I don't think of it every day uh, like I should, but uh, from time to time, it's, uh, it's humbling to consider of all the places that I could have been born and brought up and reared and raised, God saw fit to place me in this country uh, where we have unparalleled freedom and liberty and uh, where we have a, a level of uh, wealth and their standard of living. It's nowhere in the world do they have the standard of living uh, that we have. It's just uh, across, across the, the whole country. There may be little pockets here and there in some of these uh, regimes where, you know, somebody's just incredibly wealthy where they live different from the people but as an average when you look at our standard of living it's unparalleled and that's why our economy uh, is one of the strongest economies in the world and has led the world for a, a long time China sort of sneak up on us there but uh, at 330 million we're still kicking it per capita if you compare our um, population to that of China. So we have a, a, well, much, much to be thankful for. This isn't supposed to break down into some uh, discussion on economics and that sort of thing. That's not what this is about. I wanted us to consider this morning what we truly have to be thankful for and, and the concept of Thanksgiving. And we think back at this time of year to those pilgrims who said we want a different way of life. We want to be able to worship God freely and not have the king determine whether we'll be 
uh, this denomination or that denomination. We want to have the ability to worship God the way that he speaks to our heart, and we want to have freedom. And they came and they had that difficult journey, and they were so thankful, and we know about that first Thanksgiving. But the concept of Thanksgiving doesn't come from the pilgrims. In fact, the concept of Thanksgiving came from God, and it was a part of his instructions to the nation of Israel. And we're going to go all the way back to Old Testament this morning and look at Leviticus. I know, you're standing there thinking to yourself, Leviticus, mm, that doesn't sound like it's going to be real interesting reading this morning. It's not a snappy, quick story. Uh, it's not going to be clever like our story was with Jonah uh, last week, but it is instructive for us. And so as you come to Leviticus chapter 7, I'll invite you to look at 11 through 17 of Leviticus chapter 7, and I hope that you'll see some things that look familiar to you as we consider the season of the year, Thanksgiving. And so let's look at Leviticus chapter 7, verses 11 through 17 together as we begin this morning, there in verse number 11. This is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he shall offer unto the Lord. If he offer it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with a sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil and unleavened wafers anointed with oil and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour. And I have this word underlined, fried. Amen. Verse 13, besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread. Now we're talking with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offerings. So guys, we've got cakes. We've got some fried foods. And thank you, Lord, for letting us have some yeast rolls in there as well. I can just imagine the smells are heavenly. Verse 14, and of it he shall offer one out of the whole oblation for an heave offering unto the Lord, and it shall be the priests that sprinkleth the blood of the peace offerings and the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day. They're eating it that it is offered. He shall not leave any of it until the morning, but, but, look, verse 16, but if the sacrifice of his offering be a vow or a voluntary offering, it shall be eaten the same day that he offered his sacrifice. This is very important. Follow with me. And on the morrow also, the remainder of it shall be eaten. But the remainder of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burnt with fire. And the reason for that is because they didn't have Maytag refrigerators. And so there wasn't enough refrigeration, and it wouldn't be safe for them to eat it. And so we have, before the pilgrims had a Thanksgiving, God's people were cooking a lot of food, thanking the Lord, and they were eating leftovers. And does that not sound like what's going to happen here this month? We're going to cook a lot of food. We're going to be thanking the Lord because I'm going to be at my mother-in-law's house, and I'm going to tell you, here's the way it goes. We're going to have to say something that we're thankful for. Besides, I'm thankful for this feast that I'm fixing to gorge myself on. We're going to have to say things that we're thankful for. And uh, so we'll be doing that. And then uh, after it's all said and done, and we have eat all we want on Thanksgiving Day, my mother-in-law is going to do this. Out will come the very expensive um, portable uh, food transportation called Cool Whip containers. And you take all those Cool Whip containers and you load them up with the leftovers and she might separate the dark meat from the white meat. Thank you, Lord. And uh, that way you don't have to dig around for it. Uh, and then she'll, she'll just load it up with all these goodies and we'll eat that for days. And uh, with the Israelites couldn't because they didn't have refrigeration, but 
thank the Lord we have refrigeration and we'll be able to get two or three days out of those leftovers. And then on the last day, what happens? Turkey salad sandwiches, amen? And then that's sort of it. And then the, the Thanksgiving feast is over. Now, that's kind of a light way of looking, but seriously, we mentioned the pilgrims earlier. You know, the pilgrims were following the example of the Jews when they had their Thanksgiving service. And uh, they considered themselves to be a type of Israel. They even referred to the crossing of the Atlantic as their passing through the Red Sea. And they actually referred to the evil king that was uh, so uh, infringing upon their ability to worship the Lord the way that they felt led to. They referred to him as a Pharaoh. And so they looked at themselves as a type of Israel just following that pattern that God had long before established with his people, the nation of Israel, back in the book of Leviticus. But the idea of being grateful for God's extraordinary blessings upon a nation are expressed clearly for us in another Old Testament book. So go to Deuteronomy, and this time we're going to look at chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. So we see that in practice, Israel had times when they would cook a lot of food. Uh, they would eat it. They would, uh, in addition to that great feast, uh, offer praises uh, to the Lord, and uh, then they would consume leftovers after that, which looks a lot like Thanksgiving. Uh, but in Deuteronomy chapter 8, we have the Lord uh, telling Israel that this ought to be a practice of their nation, that gratitude ought to be a practice. It ought to be a routine in their life. So Deuteronomy. Chapter 8, verses 1. Well, we're just going to read the chapter. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. Thou shalt remember, remember, all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. Remember that. Remember, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, and he fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And if that sounds familiar to you, it's because Jesus quoted from this very verse when Satan tried to tempt him after his 40 days in the wilderness of fasting. This was the way that Satan tried to tempt him, and Jesus answered him with that quote from that scripture. Verse number four. God's asking him to remember these things. Remember, I brought you out. Remember, I fed you. Remember, verse four, thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. God is telling them that he made it so that their feet didn't wear out their shoes. Forty years in the wilderness. Now, there wasn't but a couple of them that lasted 40 years. Because if you'll remember, everybody but Joshua, Caleb, and even Moses uh, that, that was above 20 years or older, they all had to die out there in the wilderness. So it was a lot of younger people, but still their shoes didn't wear out in all that time that they were wandering around in the wilderness, and God uh, made it so that their feet didn't swell. Now, I got married to my wife coming up on 32 years ago, and when my wife and I were married, I wore a 10 and a half shoe. Okay, uh, at, at the time of my marriage to my wife, I was a full-grown adult. Uh, I ran close to, I'm close to 60 pounds heavier 
than I was at that time, but I wasn't no little bean pole, you know. I can give up 60 and still look pretty pretty fat, you know. So I was I was full grown. Here I am. I'm wearing a ten and a half shoe. If you forced me to wear a ten and a half shoe today, I would I would just be in pain and suffering. But ten and a half got it done for me, you know, thirty two years ago. I can't imagine your feet staying the same, especially being on them as much as they were walking around. I I've driven my whole life. I haven't had a walk wherever I went. And so I can't imagine how my feet would have been different after 40 years. Their shoes didn't wear out, but their feet didn't change either. That's supernatural. And God says, I just don't want you to forget that. So just remember that. And so thy raiment waxed not old, neither did thy foot swell. Verse 5, thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. I chasten the ones that I love. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. Listen to all those things mentioned there. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread, listen to this, without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten and art full, and art full then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. I say amen to that. There's a lot of good things mentioned in there. God says, I want you to remember how I've taken care of you, met your needs, and then these very specific things are mentioned, the water, the wheat, the barley, the vines, the fig trees, the pomegranates, the olive oil, the honey, bread without scarceness, stones of iron for building, and the mineral content is even revealed in that we can dig out the brass. Man, this is indeed sums up in verse number 10, a good land. Now, following verse number 10, we come to the last half. We got exactly the first 10 verses. That was all good. And now the last 10 verses are a sober warning for Israel. And so let's continue the reading in verse number 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Uh, he, he talks about commandments, judgments, and statutes. We wrap all that up into one word called obedience. Uh, and so we would say just be obedient. But with God... It, there's not a wasted word in the word. And so because God talks about commandments, he talks about judgments, and he talks about statutes, we think of all those things as one thing uh, underneath being obedient. It's just God's way of reiterating how very important it is. I'll, I'll demonstrate this, for example. Uh, my wife... She'll say to me, hey, uh, we need some bread. Would you stop and get some bread on the way home? All right. So uh, that's one level, okay, of urgency. And so I, I might respond and bring home a loaf of bread. Now, if I, because I'm old and I forget things, if I forget to bring home that bread, you know, our world doesn't end because I forgot to bring home that loaf of bread. But if it's something really important that I'm supposed to do, like if we got a bill that didn't get mailed off in time to go through the mail to get to the place, and she needs me to drop off the bill someplace, she'll say to me, hey, uh, we owe this bill on the trash. So when you go by there uh, weighing out on your trash truck, 
you need to pay this bill up there to the sanitation people or we're going to be late. Hey, pay the bill or we'll be late. And she'll say it two or three times. Well, when God wants, he's, he's pointing out his urgency about how urgent it is for us to be obedient. He's mentioning three different ways here in verse number 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God and not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. And obedience is pretty important, guys. Now, he's going to give us the reasons why we need to be obedient because there's a list of stuff that we don't want to have happen to us that happens when we don't follow his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes. Let's read on. Look at verse number 12. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God, which what? brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, my power, and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. And it shall be, thou do, do it all. Forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish as the nations, which the Lord destroyeth before your face. So shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. All right, so hey, ten verses, really good things. I mean, this is great. God's pour out his uh, wealth, uh, out his blessing on us in an unparalleled fashion. And then we come down to verse number 11. And the final 10 verses of that passage is a flip around and say, Hey, all this is because of your obedience. And when you fall out of obedience and when you forget what the Lord has done for you, then this is what happens. All right, so... What's the message this morning? Two things. Number one, so much to be thankful for. Man, we really are blessed. Uh, I was listening to a real strange statistic that uh, it's funny because it's stuck in my mind. That if you make like $55,000 a year, if you make like $55,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of the world. That 99% of the world's population lives on less than $55,000 a year. You say, well, Brother Danny, I don't make $55,000. All right, well, if you make above like $30,000 or something like that, you're in like the top 90%. So... We are extraordinarily blessed in our country. Uh, to, well, Brother Danny, it costs more here than it does in some other places. I got it. I realize there's places in the world where you can live for $2 a day. You can't live here for $2 a day. I get that. But uh, it's just really extraordinary uh, that we are so blessed. So we do have so much to be thankful for. Uh, when I was a kid, I thought, all the oil came from the Middle East. That's what I thought. I thought because that's where we was getting all our oil from. We was getting barrels and barrels from Saudi Arabia, making them rich. I didn't realize that we had more oil than anybody else underneath our country. I didn't realize that. Uh, so we're extremely, extremely blessed. So 
under so much to be thankful for, I see just a couple of things here. I noticed that in verse number 2 of Deuteronomy chapter 8, the Lord reminds them, some of the, in verse number 3 as well, that some of these things came about. They were blessings, but they also brought humility. What are you talking about? Well, the Israelites were hungry, and they didn't have any way to provide for themselves. And so the Lord said, I'm going to feed you daily. And do you remember how that worked? He sent manna that came like dew on the ground. And every morning, the Jews there in the wilderness would exit their tent and they would go out where the Lord had placed this manna for them all around. And they simply gathered up what they were going to eat for the day. They didn't have an oven. They didn't have a hot pocket. They didn't have a microwave. They didn't have anything. And so God fed them with manna. You have to eat. You have to eat in order to live. And so the Lord provided them manna. It's humbling when you can't take care of yourself, isn't it? Have you ever been where you couldn't take care of yourself? You ever been so sick that you just couldn't take care of yourself? And somebody else had to come in. Isn't that, isn't that humiliating? Isn't that terrible? I, I can't think of any more humbling experience than that experience that happens only in the, well, I guess not only in the hospital, but uh, especially in the hospitals where you can't get out of your bed, but you've got to take care of that very important need that we all have to take care of at least a few times a day, and you're not able to get out of your bed to take care of that need, and some nurse has to come in and help you take care of that need that we all know that I'm talking about in an uncomfortable fashion. And you said, I can't imagine. That's just humiliating right there. I can't take care of this. I, it, it, you feel like you're reduced to just being like a baby again. When you just have to be, everything has to be done for you. You learn humility when the Lord provides for you. We have so much to be thankful for. It's humbling that he meets our needs in such an extraordinary way and thorough way I can't tell you how many times in our family that uh, dad didn't know how we were going to meet a bill but when he went down to the mailbox and he pulled out there was just an, a check in an envelope that he didn't expect somebody wanted to be a blessing that has carried on even to this ministry uh, and brother Denver testified to this that sometimes he goes out to the mailbox or Miss Kim and there's a check. There's money in there that we didn't expect that the Lord provides in an extraordinary way. It's humbling, isn't it? Then uh, the next thing I notice under, we've got so much to be thankful for. You know, it's an honor. It's an honor. God saw fit to trust you with the responsibility to be born in this country. It's a superhero movie thing in that Spider-Man movie to whom much is given, much should be required, you know, make, make most out of your life. But that's a spiritual principle. To whom much is given, much should be required. God trusted you with much when he granted you birth in this nation, think about that. We have a great responsibility to the blessings that God has given. It's an honor. And then it's honest. Uh, he's talking about thankfulness and thanksgiving. And look at verse number 10. He says, When thou hast eaten and art full, then... Thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. He didn't ask you. And I would, it wouldn't be wrong of him to ask you. It'd be fine because he can do whatever he wants. But in, in, uh, in our 
understanding of fairness. Look how honest God is here. He's saying, I want your, uh, your thanks and your uh, praise after you've been filled. He says, when thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. I'm not going to say the name, but there was a guy that was the president of our country a little while back that acted like he was worthy of our praise before he ever did anything. In fact, uh, I think the Nobel Committee put him up for a peace prize before he ever had sworn in or something. I was like, what's this? Who is this cat, you know, that act, acting like he's all that? God doesn't ask for your praise. He's worthy of your praise before he ever does. Thing one, because you're alive. But he didn't say that to the nation of Israel. Remember that verse, taste and see? God's not unfair. He's honest. He says, I'm going to get your blessing, but don't give it until after you've eaten. Now, Brother Danny just told us not to pray for our food. That's, that's what the kids are back there saying. So gobble, gobble, gobble. No, uh, I think it's appropriate for you to ask the Lord's blessing on your food. Here's what I'm saying. Have you ever thought of it this way? Pray for your meal that the Lord will bless it. And then after you were blessed by the wonderful meal, stop and thank him again for it. Wouldn't that be appropriate? That's sort of the pattern that he laid out here for us thank me for what I've done for you it's honest it's humbling it's an honor and it's honest and then number two that last part of that passage verses 11 through 20 shows us that there's so much to lose there's so much to lose I don't know if you were trying to sort of make a mental list of the things that we were reading about in those first 10 verses but uh, we talked about water and good land and wheat and barley and vines and fig trees pomegranates and honey and and uh, just a little bit about the mineral content but when we came over uh, to verses 11 through 12 we started talking about um, goodly houses and herds and and flocks that were multiplying and silver and gold are mentioned not just brass the much more valuable minerals are mentioned and and um, uh, it's, it's it's exponentially greater wealth is what's being described in that category of things that you can lose so I see three things underneath so much to lose that I want to just focus on for a few minutes and then then we'll be dismissed first of all bad memory bad memory that's pointed out right there in verse number 17 uh, God said it was me I made your shoes last uh, I fed you with manna that your fathers didn't even know about I provided all your needs all this and by the time we get to verse number 17 we've got it all wrong it says and thou say in thy heart my power and my might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth no 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 that came as a direct result of the Lord's blessing so on the path of losing it starts off with your bad memory you don't remember it right God blessed you God is the source of your blessing it's not you sometimes after a while we start taking things for granted right we start thinking well this is just the way it's going to be and uh, I no, no greater example than that because I like football analogies than watching that Alabama game last night with our son they come in and and uh, oh we're going to do good and all that stuff and I, I'll give it to you Alabama won and it was a shutout but uh, up to this point, Alabama has really put up some big numbers on, their, on the teams that they, they face. They hadn't faced a defense quite as strong as this uh, LSU defense that they faced last night. And so uh, you sort of take it for granted that we're not going to get 50 points. You know, Why didn't we get 50 points? Well, we won the game. But you see, the more, more that you're blessed, you just start taking it for granted. You get a bad memory. You stop, you stop remembering about the way that it was and, 
and, and uh, the way that God's blessed you. Under so much to, to lose, the second thing I notice here, it is a bad attitude. My power, my hand, I got me this. That's just a wrong attitude for us to have. Your home, your job, your family, all those things are blessings given to you by God. It wasn't your doing. Well, I'm my own man. I'm a self-made man, yes. And God made you. God gave you the abilities, the talents, and the gifts. And I'll remind you of this, that God will uh, hold you accountable uh, for those blessings and talents and gifts that he's bestowed upon you. It does you well uh, not to forget uh, the source of that because one day you'll stand before him and there will be a reconciliation. And he'll say, I've given you these talents and these abilities. How have you used them? Don't be like that servant that buried it and just says, here's what you gave me right back. No, we're all struggling for and should be struggling for that great two-word answer. Well done. Well done. That's what we're all working for. At least that's my prayer for you this morning. So, this, but on this road to losing everything, we have a bad memory and we have a bad attitude. And what's that all lead up to? Finally, a bad outcome. A bad outcome. It shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God. This is verse 19. And walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you. You say, Brother Danny, I'm not worshiping some other god. I'm not into that idol worship stuff. No, oh, okay. That's just an ancient way of describing what we do. When we say God isn't the first thing in my life. God's not the number one priority in my life. He's in there. He's near the top. He's just not the top. When God's not the top priority in our life, we are just as guilty as who God is warning Israel about right here, because we've placed some other thing in that position of preeminence that should be reserved exclusively for God and our relationship to Him. And so it shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall per surely perish as the nations which the Lord hath destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. How many folks have you seen God's judgment in their lives? Have you friends? that have wrecked homes. We've got families in our church that have experienced that kind of hurt. Ruined testimonies. Jobs lost. We see the wake of disaster that follows people who don't place God in that position of preeminence in their life. We see the destruction. We see the warning signs all along the way. Why isn't that enough? Why isn't that enough for us to step back and say, wow, that didn't work out so good for him or for her. Let that be a caution to us. God's having to tell the very children of Israel to not ignore those signs. He says, These nations which the Lord destroyeth right before your face. If God produced a miracle 
right in front of you that changed your life. Would you sit there in your pew this morning, friend, and say, well, that'd make a big difference to me. I don't think I could ignore that. If God worked out this miracle, this miraculous thing, I don't think that I could ignore that. I couldn't. That would change me forever. Really. Really. Because I'll just remind you of God's little list that he ran here for these folks. Uh, Their feet didn't swell for 40 years. Their clothes didn't wear out. He fed them every day. That's a miracle on everyday basis, guys. And yet, he's having to tell them, because you would not be obedient unto the Lord your God, you're going to face this destruction, and you're going to perish. It's a bad outcome. Why? Because of bad memory and bad attitude. So where do we need to be? We need to have... An attitude of thanksgiving and gratitude. That ought to be just a part of our life. It ought to be a part of your, uh, your daily experience. And as we look in the next couple of weeks, sp- specifically next week, we're going to gather into being thankful, even when it's difficult for us to be thankful. It ought to be a part of of our lives and if it's not if gratitude is not a part of your life then you have an issue with obedience this morning and that's why we have the invitation right now so that you and I can analyze our heart that we can look inside there and say Lord if I'm not being obedient if I haven't been obedient to you I need to confess that right now let's pray Heavenly Father thank you for this day thank you Lord for speaking to us clearly from your word today and I ask dear Lord if there's any of us gathered in here this morning and we haven't been grateful we haven't been thankful well my life's been hard there ain't a whole lot to be thankful for no 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 Lord you have blessed us in so many extraordinary ways just by letting us being born in this country there's no hardship that cancels out the thanksgiving that we should have in our hearts for you I pray dear Lord if you've spoken some heart this morning someone who struggles with ingratitude or that that uh, attitude of unthankfulness and unthankful spirit. I pray that you'll speak to that heart this morning, that right now, during this moment of invitation, they'll step forward. They'll come down to this aisle and they'll speak to you and have their heart rekindled with thanksgiving and gratefulness towards your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you will.